Hello everyone and welcome to today's webinar. We have today with us Bob Beard. He is our customer engagement specialist here at Anovia Consulting and he's going to be discussing with us what NAV has to offer in Warehouse Management System, WMS. And we're just uh, letting you know that we do record all of our webinars. So this webinar will be recorded and it will be available for you to review again or share with any of your other colleagues and friends uh, later this week on our website at anovia.com. And we just ask that if you have any questions, uh, please feel free to type them into the questions box and we will get them called out toward the end of the webinar. And so now I will turn it over to Bob and he will begin our presentation. Thanks, Angie. Well, welcome to the webinar. Um, as Angie said, my name is Bob Beard. I'm a customer engagement specialist with Anovia. And uh, I thought I'd give you first, before getting into the presentation, just a little bit of my background and qualifications. I've been a CIO and a VP of supply chain with a number of firms, spent a lot of time on really all my career in manufacturing and distribution. And I've run management consulting groups and technology consulting groups. And more particular to this presentation, I've helped implement WMS solutions, um, reasonably large WMS solutions with integrations to NAV when I was VP of supply chain. And also actually to GP, believe it or not, with the division of Nissan. Um, and I've also worked with our clients in helping decide how to go forward with warehouse management. So that's a little bit of why I'm doing this. Um, so let's get on to the session objectives. So the first thing we wanna do here is really understand the reasons for and the basic concepts behind warehouse management. So why warehouse management? Then I'll give you an outline of warehouse management capabilities that are inherent in NAV. Um, just a note, uh, with my background, I'm not an application consultant, um, but I know a reasonable about, my, about, about NAV, obviously, which is why I'm doing this. So if there's any questions at the end that get into functionality that kind of extends beyond my knowledge, um, we'll refer those to people on our staff with deeper expertise and get back to you. Um, and also then I want to provide an overview, at least, of what additional capabilities you can find in third-party solutions. So I won't go in depth into third-party, but just get to give a feel. Uh, that's a question I often get about what else should I be looking at beyond that. So hopefully that uh, those objectives meet your uh, expectations and the agenda follows right along. We're gonna do a little warehouse management 101, um, then talk about what you can do in NAV, and then finally talk about beyond just NAV, uh, third-party warehouse solutions. So let's get into Warehouse Management 101. And, you know, if you think about it, um, you know, depending on, uh, you can actually, if you're in NAV, you can set up a location and then just sell and purchase from that location without doing warehouse-specific tasks. You create a sales order and post it. You can ship an invoice from the sales order. You can do the same thing with a purchase order. You can receive and pay from the PO. Um, and de frankly, depending on the size and nature of your business, that might be a perfectly fine answer, right? Um, so there's nothing wrong with that uh, if that's what you're doing. Um, but depending on the nature and size of your business, you're, you may be missing some things that you should be considering. First of all, just think of it, you've centralized all your inventory related activity. I mean, you don't want the warehouse workers to getting typically um, messing with sales orders. So if you're doing the simple, very simplified version, uh, somebody's bringing in and saying, hey, I've shipped this stuff, we're writing things down, shipping it, and then somebody is uh, shipping and invoicing from the sales order. Um, so you have, and there's no segregation of duties there. You've added some uh, manual processes. Uh, and frankly, you don't know where stuff is. Um, and you don't really know how much you have at any one point 
in time because there's a gap between when you receive and you record or when you ship and you record. Um, and you don't know where you're at in the process. So something got sent out to the warehouse to ship and well, has it been picked yet? Where are we at in the process? You don't know that. And then not unusually, you're gonna be passing on some efficiency improvements in the warehouse, uh, managing the warehouse. They seem all that perfectly obvious, but frankly, um, there's a lot of people that you know have to think through exactly how much you've got to you want to why you want to use warehouse management and how much. That's what we're going to talk about. So, um, let me just give a, a little bit of philosophy just from my experience. I worked uh, when I was a CIO of a very large distribution firm with a guy who was head of the National Association of Wholesale Distributors, and he drilled this piece into me that. In distribution, and this is even if you're a manufacturer and you're distributing, the end game is managing inventory and cash. Um, all your results come from that. And then obviously also exceeding customer expectations. You've got to keep the customer happy. That is the end game as, as well. But in terms of performance, it's managing cash and inventory. Everybody understands the cash side. Cash is cash. Uh, conceptually, we all get that. You want to get the money in as soon as possible, bill and receive the money uh, and be in a positive cash position. But that often puts inventory, in my experience, into people's minds as kind of a second class citizen. A number of years ago, there was an old dis famous distribution guru named Gordon Graham. And he used to use this analogy. This is where I learned it. So if you think of inventory as cash, makes things a little different. So how would you react if you, you'd say, oh, that pallet of hundreds is just somewhere over by the east wall? I think it, I put it there yesterday. Um, I've always found that illustration illuminating. Uh, it, it, it speaks to, yeah, maybe I need to pay more attention to that because your inventory really is a pallet of dollars, right? It's really an asset, an important asset that's sitting out there. So let's talk about the goals of warehouse management. Obviously, it's inventory accuracy. That's the foundation of any manufacturing and distribution firm in terms of operations. And it's inventory accuracy in real time or as close to real time as you can get it. Um, another goal of warehouse management is just your efficiency of operations. It's managing the warehouse, managing uh, the people in the warehouse, being be uh, better able to measure um, and that should have said to measure and manage operations. And also implementing warehouse management can mean better use of, kind of forces better use of warehouse space. And, but um, using some of the techniques behind uh, warehouse management stuff in the, that's in there, you can better use your warehouse space. You also start enabling item tracking. So um, if you're selling serialized or lot number items, um, it can be extremely important to track those. Uh, if you're in the food business, and I've done a lot of work with food businesses, that's critical. Um, that's critical to the materials that go into making the end product and the end product itself. And you can also manage expiration dates as well and uh, not uh, reduce the amount of expired material you have out in your shelves. But at the end of the day, like anything, uh, warehouse, the goal of warehouse management is increasing your ability to meet or exceed those customer expectations. It's getting stuff in and out the door as efficiently and effectively as possible. So here's a little graphic kind of stole, stolen from the e-learning that Microsoft provides, but um, you know, this really kind of gives you a feeling about what we're talking about, the basic flow in warehouse management. You've got inbound goods, whether they're purchases, transfers, returns uh, coming in, you're gonna receive them. You may or may not do a uh, difference receiving and put away step. You might do those in one step, um, but then you're gonna pick and you're going to, um, and you're either gonna pick for shipping, you're gonna pick for assembly or pick for manufacturing. Um, you might do some movement here in the middle. We've got some movement, uh, replenishment. You move items around, you replenish picking locations. We'll talk about that. 
that involves more put away if it comes from manufacturing and assembly there's more put away and then finally you can also have from receiving and you can do what's called cross stocking which is taking items that are on sales orders that need to be shipped as soon as possible and cross stock not put them away put them right into the shipping location and ship them out and then the outbound movement, obviously, picking an outbound involves sales orders, transfers, transfer orders, returns, um, and, and service orders, by the way. The service orders don't show up here, but um, the service order shipments as well. So that's the fundamental conceptual framework, and I'll bring that slide up um, later on in the presentation. But of course, there's costs of doing this, you know. If there weren't costs, everybody would do more complicated movement and tracking like in, in the uh, graphic I just showed you. So you've got, uh, as, as you can see here, it's more complex processes. Um, there's gonna be some additional overhead in labor. Um, if you're gonna track inventory movements more specifically, there's, even, uh, there's overhead and labor associated with that. You're recording additional data, you're managing that data, you're reporting on that data, there's costs to that. Um, it's not absolutely required, but very often, and especially if you wanna be real time, there's gonna be uh, RF hardware involved and infrastructure to support that RF hardware. Um, that's another cost. And then, again, it may or may not require third-party software, additional software. Well, that's software, that's more infrastructure, that's implementation and support costs. So. Um, you know, in the end, and this is when I'm over, I'm talking to clients on this, you just need to strike a balance between the benefits that you're going to get, um, inventory accuracy, all the stuff I just talked about, and the complexity and the cost. And so there's a lot of, there's a lot of decision making in this process. Um, warehouse management, often the ROI cases can be pretty straightforward depending where you're at, um, but it's your business decision whether you want to embark on this. Um, just a quick little memory on that. I once went into a, a um, fairly good sized distribution company, privately held. We did an analysis and said, hey, you can improve your inventory returns, reduce obsolete inventory, deliver more on time, et cetera. Here's the ROI case. Here's what it's gonna to cost to implement. Our OEI case was clear and the owner just said, you know, it's too much effort on my IT staff and the people I got in the warehouse, no thank you. Um, he was literally leaving hundreds of thousands of dollars on the table, but that's the business decision. And uh, you know, any business at the end of the day comes up to how management wants to allocate its dollars and uh, what's important to management. So, Get into the next piece. Much you can do in NAV. And um, again, the intention is, you know, you could we could get into hours of discussion <laughs> on on, uh, on what NAV can do and how to do it in NAV. Um, my intention here is to give you a feel about what you can do in NAV, um, where things reside. Um, but obviously not to do a complete uh, seminar or, or uh, a webinar on, on that, on how to, on all the specifics. So going back to my basics of warehouse management, not really going to talk about um, warehouse management related to assembly and manufacturing, although it will hopefully kind of come out um, in this discussion, you'll get an idea. Um, and I'm not going to talk that much about cross-docking. I think the concept's pretty simple, but I'll, I'll touch on it a little bit. Um, so the rest of it, though, we'll touch on. And we'll touch on uh, what needs to be done in NAV and what NAV capabilities are. So number one is you got to start somewhere, right? Well, you got to start somewhere, and that's with the location. Let's start with location. Um, I'm just going to say a location is a warehouse. A location in NAV is a warehouse. It's a logical concept. I realize that, but uh, to me, the best, simplest way to think of a location is a warehouse. Um, and you can have locations and specify, obviously, multiple locations in NAV. 
that use or don't use warehouse management capabilities. Um, if you look in the Kronos database, there's a third-party warehouse. So you can have a third-party warehouse where you want to track your inventory there. Maybe you own the, you know, it's your inventory. Um, but you certainly don't, if it's third-party warehouse, you're not going to be specifying, you know, picking movements or put away movements. That's going to be up to them. You just want to know what inventory you've got there. Um, you can set the degree of management in the location record. And that's the reason we're starting with location. Location, along with the bins and bins and zones, is the foundation of a system to guide how where you put stuff, where stuff goes, how stuff gets picked, right? So that's the starting point. And in terms of advanced warehousing, um, kind of uh, warehouse management, not, not totally warehouse management, but advanced warehousing in NAV, there's one key item in the location field and that's saying directed pick and put away um, if you want to look in the test database the demo database um, it, the white warehouse in chronos is set up as a directed pick and put away we'll talk more about what this means in the following slides but that then clicks all of the other functions um, above all these things you see above if you click direct it, put away. So that's the location there of that information. And let's talk about directed pick and put away if you choose that. Um, again, as I said, it'll check most of those options above it. We'll talk a little bit more about those. It brings warehouse zones, the concept of zones into play. We'll talk about that. It's support, and that that then direct and put a, pick and put away supports some processes that optimize your warehouse operations, right? If you don't do directed pick or put away, your bin selection is either your last bin where the product uh, went or a fixed bin. You can say this product always goes in uh, this particular bin. Obviously, directed put, pick and put away is going to require more processes. Um, if you select that, you're also enabling ADCS. I'm not going to talk a lot about ADCS. That's Advanced Data Collection System. I believe that's right for the acronym. Um, and that's the inherent NAV, very basic uh, barcode data collection. And you can, on each transaction in NAV, specify some criteria, how things are going to look, uh, with, with a lot of limits around it, how things are going to look on um, barcode scanning devices. Um, but if you Select this, you're enabling that in NAV. Another thing which I'm not going to get into in detail is it also disconnects the warehouse from the inventory subledger. I'll just make the probably fairly obvious point. If you're moving items from one place to another, say from a bulk storage bin to a picking bin, it doesn't affect your inventory subledger. So this would say I can do those transactions and I'm not posting anything to inventory. Uh, again, I'm not going to get in detail any other details about the accounting aspects of this, but that's one thing to note. So if you say, hey, I, that direct to pick and put away is too complex, I just can't manage that, and we'll see some of the details and why you might say that, then you can, you can just pick and choose from these other options that are on that location. Um, you can say, I want to require receive, I want to require a shipment. One thing that is a pretty key decision is bin mandatory. Uh, bin mandatory means um, everything has to go in a bin. Um, and, and one thing I one thing I want to mention is you know when you think of bin, don't literally think of a bin, a physical bin. Just think of it as a logical location in the warehouse. It may very well be a physical bin. Might also be some part of an aisle or some part of the warehouse that you've marked off, uh, you've painted and marked off. Uh, I worked with a large marshmallow manufacturer that uh, would do that because they make skids and skids and uh, skids of marshmallows, store them up to the ceiling. And uh, effectively a bin was uh, a long area in one section of the warehouse that was marked off as a row. I mean, it was really a row, uh, but it wasn't a physical bin. If you think of banking bin mandatory, you know, bin is pretty essential if you're doing inventory counting. 
Because if you're doing inventory counting, cycle counting, you want to say go over there. There has to be an over there, right? There has to be a specific area and count that. So uh, bin mandatory is a pretty key decision in terms of how you set up warehouses. Um, another piece is if you select the require shipment and require um, received, and you've picked, you've said put away and pick, um, then you can batch, um, batch your picking. So you, otherwise you're doing order by order, right? You're picking or shipping order by order, you're putting away order by order, or you're shipping order by order. Um, so again, there's a, the potential in NAV, depending on how you set things up, to um, pick a lot of orders at once or put away a lot of receipts at once. Well, I'll go back to the location. There's other specifications in the location. You can note other things you can set up. Um, default receipt bin, so anytime something comes in, there's a default receipt bin. Um, in our shipping area, here's the shipment bin code. Um, here's when production, you know, here's where materials go to production. Something coming out of production will go to a certain location. And if I'm going to allow cross stocking at that location, I can uh, specify that. I'm not going to get into a lot of that detail, but I just wanted to make you aware of a lot of stuff you can specify on the location card. So let's talk about the next level down, zones and bins. So if a zone is another area in the warehouse that typically has some kind of specified function, like my shipping zone, my receiving zone, my bulk storage zone, um, it could also be a zone when I was, I was CIO of a company that did um, chemicals and we actually had a zone in our, every one of our warehouse that was um, a bunker because some of the chemicals were explosive, right? So we had to specify um, those items. That was a zone for that kind of storage and we had to specify which items went into that zone. Um, but that's the idea of a zone. It's a subset of a warehouse. Um, and again, that's brought into play when you do directed pick and put away. A bin, you don't have to have directed put, pick and put away. That's just, again, a logical or physical location in the warehouse. It's the smallest unit of storage and nav in a warehouse. Um, and, the, you know, at the end of the, the, you know, important point of this is it really takes planning systems planning and obviously physical planning to lay out a warehouse into zones and bins. Specify things like we're going to talk about briefly, uh, like bin ranking. Usually requires a lot of experimentation and adjustment. So don't think of this as set forever, um, but think it through. Spend a serious amount of time thinking it through. Here's just a little graphic about zones. Instead of zone one, two, or three, these could be I could have said receiving zones, shipping zone, bulk storage zone. Um, I've got some coding on a zone. You can, um, I will talk about that here. We'll look at the functionality. Uh, you can specify bin types. A bin type specifies the inward and inbound and outbound flow of material in a zone. Zone ranking, that's something that then gets copied to all bins in the zone. Doesn't mean you can't over override that, but it's copied all the bins in the zone. Uh, there's something called a warehouse class. Remember I mentioned explosive devices that could be cold storage, whatever. It's just an indicator. It's just a piece of data that says, hey, this is a particular, this is a cold storage zone or whatever. And then you can also note if special equipment is um, required. If I look at our example of zones here, you can see all of that. Bin type is important because, you know, it says this is a zone, this is a cold storage zone where I put stuff away and I pick stuff, so I can pretty much do anything. Here's a bulk storage zone that's put away only. Um, so that means that it's intended to, this is restricted to only being where items are put away. I am not going to pick, which means pick to an order um, or a shop order or an assembly order, any kind of order. Um, from this storage zone, right? Things have to be moved to a pick or a put and pick zone. We've also got QC. Like I said, these warehouse class and special equipment are just notes, but hey, I want to let people know we need a lift truck in that zone, we do that. 
zone ranking. And this also says this zone can be used for cross docking. So let's talk about bins. Bin type, as I mentioned, can re uh, restrict the functionality of the bin. The ranking, which can be inherited from the zone, um, will specify the sequence that bins are used for pick and put away. Um, you can also do things in bins like note the maximum cubage or weight. Um, those that's really just notation data. Um, you can know if uh, special equipment is going to be required to access this bin, etc. So here conceptually is I got a zone, I've got this zone here, and I've got bins within the zone, right? I'm sure you all love these brilliant graphics, but uh, you know I just thought the picture is worth a few words. So here's with uh, most of the columns shown what you can specify in a bin. I mentioned bin, bin ranking. You can see we've got 60 and 50. Um, 60, you know, the higher the number, the more preferred. These happen to be all put away zones in the white warehouse. Got some maximum cubage and weight. It's interesting the weight and cubage. This is in the Kronos database, they're the same. It typically won't be true. Um, and this is a bulk zone. So all of these are put away bins because we're in the bulk zone, right? Um, actually, if you look up bins, it also says empty. That's not something you check. The system actually um, identifies that. Again, this is some of the stuff you can set up in terms of bins. Bin type and ranking, I think, are the most important. So after you do the physical stuff, what, what do we come to next? Well, we come to items, obviously. The items are the things you're moving around. Um, you can do some specification at the item or SKU level. And just for those of you who maybe aren't familiar with SKU, I define SKU as it's the location specific information for an item, right? So if you have multiple warehouses, multiple locations, um, you can identify some location specific in data um, for that item, for that part, right? That's specific to each location. Um, so there's some information, and you'll see that coming up that mirrors bin zone. Um, you can also uh, specify an item's counting requirements. So how am I going to physically count this a cycle counting? Um, if I have a put away unit of measure that my maybe is different than I, I receive pallets, but I put it away in each. Um, you can specify that and you can say this item is eligible for cross docking. So you can turn that on or off. You don't have to, you won't necessarily cross dock every item. And very importantly, but again, I'm not going to go into much detail because it would take way, way too much time. Item track expenses specifications are at the item level. And that's serial number. I'll, I'll just take lot number. Lot number, do I record like for food processing it all the way through? Or do I only record it on shipment? Do I only record serial number on shipment? Or do I record serial number, a lot number when I receive? If you record it when you receive and put away, then obviously you've got a lot more records. Um, especially with serial numbered items uh, in your in your inventory in your warehouse management system and put away templates what put away templates we'll talk about that are specific these are specified at the item level uh, the weight and volume is also in the inventory tab um, and that's you know that's just again data uh, that could possibly be passed to a third-party warehouse management system here's the item setup here are the things I mentioned, warehouse class code, special equipment. Remember those were, were both in bins and zones. Here's the put away template code, put away unit of measure. And here's some of the physical inventory counting stuff. Um, you'll see this also with, uh, on a SKU. So let's talk a little bit about processes. If you divide this beautiful little chart into three areas, you've got your receiving, you got your internal movement and you've got your shipment. So I'm going to give you some examples of NAV capabilities on, in each one of these areas. So let's talk about inbound, right? And that's that first section up here. Um, if you've selected the directed put away, here's what um, you can do. 
put away, you can use put away templates to specify the rules. Um, and we'll look at an example of that and talk about it. You can define multiple put away templates. Um, so you can have as many as you want. Again, you assign the put away templates at the item level. And that's what the next piece says. And uh, if you don't use direct to put away, your choice, again, as I said earlier, is either fixed bin or last bin. That's what the system will do. So here's the standard in the Crotonus database, and I think a good example of a put away template. So if you think of each one of these lines here, that's a, that's a decision. This decision is first. So if there's a fixed bin, if I'd said this item goes in this bin, that's where I'm going to start. If it's the same, if the same item is there and it's the same unit of measure, right? You could store things. Bulk could be stored in a different unit of measure than where you pick. So if we got stuff in the same unit of measure and that bin has less than the minimum quantity, if it's a fixed bin, you can identify minimum and maximum quantities. That's where I'm going to move it first, right? No, I don't find anything. There's no bin with less than minimum quantity. Well, I'm going to do fixed bin, same item, unit of measure, see if I can store it. There's no fixed bin. I'm going to do what's called a floating bin, so just another any other bin that's available. Same item is going to be my preference, right? Same unit of measure, that's my third choice. Can't do that. Don't find any place to do that. Floating, same item then floating bin and an empty bin, and then just any bin, right? So that's the kind of logic you specify. Again, I remember I talked about the overhead and the thinking through. Um, it takes a fair amount of work to think through these things and what you're gonna do in terms of put away templates. Do you need multiple put away templates? Which items do you assign them to, et cetera? And, but this is for if you choose directed put away. And I will say a lot of people don't choose directed put away. So let's talk a little bit about picking. Oops, I'm not, not picking. I'm sorry. We're going to talk about the middle piece. We're going to talk about uh, replenishment, the internal movement. But in this case, I'm going to talk about replenishment. So the idea behind replenishment is I'm going to move stock from some to a preferred picking location, maybe up front, um, close to the shipping dock, et cetera, and to maximize my picking efficiency because I want to get stuff out of the door to the customer as fast as possible. If I've got other stuff, I'll put it back in bulk storage and I'll replenish. Um, you're going to move. That's, that's the example I'm using. And you can, what you can do is we kind of saw is specify some fixed bin locations and minimum and maximum quantities um, in the bin content, and then set up your replenishment worksheet. Uh, yeah. Replenishment usually, you know, as you, you may or may not know, is if you is quite often done off hours, so not when you're shipping, uh, overnight, uh, second shift, whatever. Um, so not when you're shipping and receiving, when there aren't trucks coming and going, then you, you do the replenishment activity. So here's an example of a replenishment setup. I've got a bin code. It's fixed. Here's this item. Um, you, by the way, this bin content, uh, you can set all this up in the bin content creation worksheet. So you can set up, here's my bins in the warehouse, here's the items. This, this item goes in this bin. Um, right now, this is just telling me, because you know, I'm looking at bin content, tells me what's in there. But here's the minimum quantity, and here's the maximum quantity. So right now, I don't even have my minimum quantity in the bin. So what I did in this case for this example is one, run what's called, the, um, uh, this is the bin worksheet, replenishment worksheet. I said calculate the bin replenishment, and that item, sorry about my waving lines here, at LS75 loudspeaker says I've got I've got 12 that I can I can replenish. I've got 12, let's say in bulk storage. And I'm gonna move 12 to this from this bin code to this bin code. 
I went all the way back to when I showed those put uh, those uh, put away bulk storage bins. This was one of the, as it says, bulk storage put away only bins. So I'm going to move it to a pick bin, so it can be picked for orders. And I'm going to move move 12 because if I go back, I can take up to 40. And right now I've only got I've got 12 out there. I can take up to 40. I'm going to move all 12 into that bin. So that's the concept of replenishment and how NAV can enable replenishment. So let me talk a little bit about shipping, give you some feel for that. And picking, obviously you're picking to ship and this not necessarily just picking to a sales order, you can be picking to a transfer order, et cetera. So, the simplest thing to do is pick order by order, but you can really become more efficient if you pull multiple orders to pick at a time, batch or wave picking, right? So you use the pick work, you set up a pick worksheet, you have to have some of those location boxes checked. Uh, shipment and picking require shipment and picking, set up a pick worksheet and pick a whole bunch of things for multiple orders. You can look at multiple documents when you set up a pick worksheet. So you can look at transfer orders, you can look at returns, you can look at customer orders, you can select all, whatever documents you want on various criteria. We'll look at that a little bit. Um, and set parameters around that pick. So you can set up a pick that's um, sent to an employee from one zone to pick from. You can set the maximum number of items for a pick. So, you, you know, if you're sending it out to one warehouse worker, you go, well, he can't pick more than 20 items at once. That's crazy. Or, or five or 10, whatever it is. Um, you can also set your pick, picking order, right? Uh, in various ways. And the bin, bin ranking comes into play here. Bins with the highest ranking are picked first. That's that bin set up when I talked about bin ranking. So it will direct you how to, um, how to pick. But here's all the stuff you can do in a pick. If you're creating a pick worksheet, uh, you can create a pick per the warehouse document per customer. I just want to pick, I got a bunch of orders for a customer. I'm going to pick those um, per item. I want to only pick in this zone, due dates, maximum number of pick lines. Here's the assign it. I'm going to assign it to this warehouse worker. Here's how I'm going to sort the pick lines. Um, we haven't talked about break bulk. I'll talk about that briefly, um, et cetera. So this is kind of the logic that's available to you. Again, we're not doing training, so there's a lot here. But, uh, you know, NAV can um, really kind of create these waiver batch picks in, in quite a few configurations for efficiency sake. So, um, you know, we're getting on. I want to get to the third party things, but let me just mention some other NAF warehouse functionality um, that's, that we haven't talked about. You can block movement um, and bin. You can block specific items as well, inbound or outbound. Um, I mentioned break bulk. That allows you to fill an order with an alternate unit of measure if the request, requested of unit of measure can't be found. So if they, you want to ship pallets, but I got a lot of pieces out there, I can fill it. Know, the NAV will know how many pieces go into a pallet, and I can pick the pieces and fill the pallet, as an example. Um, another piece, and we talked a little bit about item tracking, um, but another thing NAB will do for you is it'll control um, expiration date sensitive material. And again, I'll, I'll go back to food. Um, so it'll do what's called FIFO, first expiry, first, first out. So NAB will pull, will pick the things that are going to expire first um, and have, have you get those out of the warehouse first. Um, we talked about cycle counting. Again, I, I won't get into the specifics of that, but um, NAB doesn't, isn't tremendously sophisticated in that but you can set up physical inventory, um, cycle count of physical inventory codes, counting codes, and count things, uh, items at, at certain intervals, uh, and set up basically cycle counting. Um, we haven't really talked too much about warehouse worker functionality. It's pretty basic in NAV. 
um, but you can assign workers to a location. And as I showed in the pick wor worksheet, you can then assign a wave pick or a batch pick to an individual worker. But they have to be assigned to that location. So hopefully that gives you an idea about, you know, the relative robustness of what you can just do within NAV. And by the way, within NAV, that does include some real basic RF data collection capabilities using ADCS. So what if I, I go, well, yeah, but what, do, what about these third party systems, right? I see a lot of stuff about that, you know, I'm at Summit, whatever, I see a lot of third party systems. What do I get if I go to those? Do I need those? Well, I'm going to say there's basically two tiers of third party, what I would just call warehouse management systems. Uh, warehouse systems, I'm going to necessarily say warehouse management systems. One is solutions that really automate, uh, including advanced warehousing, although you don't have to use advanced warehousing in NAV, but automate warehousing in NAV and add some capabilities to NAV. I'll talk a little bit more about those. And then the second tier of, where, of warehouse systems is robust, freestanding, what I'll call full warehouse management systems that interface with NAV and offer extensive functionality. So let's talk a little bit about tier one. What, what, what's a tier one? Tier one integrates directly with NAV warehouse management code. I mean, it uses where, NAV warehouse management code. Um, but well, they all have an enhanced RF hardware interface. You know, the ADCS thing, as I mentioned, is relatively primitive. Um, the third-party systems that are out there um, will have examples are InsightWorks and Lanham will have an improved and, and more flexible, more enhanced hardware interface. Um, also offer additional NAV code so um, for other capabilities. We'll talk, I'll give you a few examples, but uh, one thing I want to emphasize is that that is NAV code. So it's it's code that they're adding on to NAV or that extends some of the capabilities of NAV, allows you to do some things you couldn't do just purely with NAV code. And for these systems, your investment is typically five figures. So you're going to be in the, let's just say 10 to 99,999 range. Um, Depending, you know, a fair amount of that is hardware. Um, if you know RF systems, RF uh, is not cheap. Um, you're often talking about a thousand dollars or more for a single uh, handheld. Um, so your investment is is typically, you know, it's hard to get less than ten thousand. Um, and depending on how many devices you want, you know, it could range in the six figures. But most of the implementations I've dealt with are in the five, stay in the five figure category. So, so okay, what do these guys do? Well, one thing I mentioned is improved RF data collection. Um, and that can include things like um, photo capture, uh, you know, that um, I've got something, I wanna take a picture of something and just store it. I just received something, it's damaged, wanna take a picture and, and have a notation. Or some people will take a picture before shipping. They've had, especially if they had trouble with your truckers, You've got stuff that's sensitive. You can take a picture before you ship something. Um, you can do item inquiries and bin inquiries from your handhold. So um, it's pretty extensive. You know, uh, it's really some nice improvements in terms of um, uh, the over that should uh, say ADCS instead of ACDS. Um, another thing that um, typically you'll get is license plating. Um, I didn't mention that as a NAV capability. It's a capability for these third-party systems. That's where you can combine multiple items, typically in a pallet, but it could be a carton um, for you know pick pack kind of things into one scannable ID. So I've got multiple items on a pallet. I create a license plate. I scan that, and the system knows here's all the things, all the individual items on the pallet. Uh, there's some additional capabilities uh, that without the NAV capability turning on, like being turned down, like doing a pick against a sales order, directly against a sales order. Um, you typically get improved item tracking, uh, for example, in production. Uh, some, some of these systems will enable fuller item tracking. When I mentioned like food production, 
end-to-end -end lot tracking uh, over NAV will improve some of those capabilities. Uh, some have uh, more sophisticated inventory count capabilities. NAV is not, as I mentioned, is not the most sophisticated thing in terms of inventory counting. It's not always the easiest to use. Um, but there are some extensions in NAV that uh, third parties will provide. These are just examples. And uh, they can also provide offline processing so that you can, if the system goes down, you can actually use the handheld um, to continue doing some warehouse ops and, um, and uh, you know, do some offline processing. Uh, there's restrictions around that, but that's another piece of capability. Some very nice capabilities. One of the core things I feel is beyond the um, kind of the add-ons to NAV, the even more ease of use is really the improved um, barcode data collection. So then what is tier two? What are we talking about in tier two? And this is where I, and it's just maybe this is my bias, but I'm gonna call these really warehouse management systems. Um, and, uh, so I'll, uh, my, the way I think of these is a warehouse operations ERP. So third party, a, a full tier two third party WMS is really something if you've got a substantial warehouse, multiple warehouses, um, you're doing, you, you really need to optimize the operations, track the operations, really just almost run the warehouse like a business. And this isn't necessarily only if you're just a distributor, manufacturers sometimes require this kind of thing. Um, again, it's just how extensive and how complex are your warehousing operations. Um, and these tier two things, they have their own database and code base. So it's not an extension of NAV, right? So you're really interfacing with NAV. Uh, I went back and, and looked at uh, the NAV piece, the interfaces we specified uh, when I was a VP of supply chain in IT. And they were, they were at the order. I mean, so it's typically, here's where we need to interface. Sales order, PO, transfer order, inventory levels, item levels. Um, what I'm saying here is really the warehouse management system is going to handle a lot of those operations that you might other that you'd otherwise do in NAV. So you don't have to do. They're going to have their own setup, their own maintenance, and their own level of sophistication. And you're not going to mirror all of that zone, uh, bin, etc. stuff in NAV. You don't have to because this is a full warehouse operations ERP. That's the way I I think of it. So hard and the hardware interfaces, their code base doesn't use ADCS, right? And there's robust capabilities that include things like kitting, even production, uh, multi-level bombs, additional supply chain capabilities. And then finally, you're talking six figures here, right? Um, these are not systems that you implement. Um, Solo Globe is one that we've worked a fair amount with. The, 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 you're not, you're not gonna implement them for $50,000. Know, you're gonna be in the six figures, depending on how many warehouses, how many devices, how many people, all of that how many operations, what you need, um, you know, this could go into the three, 400,000, even, even beyond that range. Um, so these are serious warehouse operations ERP systems. So what do you get for all that? Um, you get the, what I'll call item slotting. So advanced um, capability to specify where items go and where they should be slotted. Um, statistics on that kind of information, how you should how you should just set up your warehouse, how you're going to where you're going to put items for maximum efficiency in picking. That's labeling, um, so you can label you can specify. Here's my customers' labeling requirements, um, SSCC codes, etc. Um, warehouse worker management. Um, you know some of the tier two um, people, by the way, will report because they're tracking picks. And they know who did picks, so they'll they'll report on those those kind of statistics. Um, but more advanced warehouse worker management is available in the tier twos. Uh, more sophisticated assignment, that kind of, kind of thing. Um, more sophisticated zone and, and wave picking, consolidating, um, truck loading. Here's something you're just not going to see in, in typically in NAV. So here's where my trucks are coming. Here's this order's being pucked up. This truck is going to dock three. I want to sequence how I load the truck, right? So it, I'm going to, 
assign the truck to this door. I'm going to sequence uh, how my pallets go into a truck. Um, you've got in transit visibility, not the John and NAV, but again, enhanced in transit visibility. Um, these systems will have traceability, enhanced traceability, re even have recall reporting. Um, again, I'm going to speak to my food experience. That's critical. Um, quality control, it's not at all unusual to see quality control capability. So something comes in, receiving damage, report receiving damage there, um, reported out of kitting, shipping, et cetera. Um, so you'll actually have some, some elements of quality in these systems. Um, I mentioned more advanced kitting and assembly. Sometimes the kitting and assembly is done in the system, right? And then I'll tell NAV, here's the pieces I consumed. And here's here's the finished goods I created, and I went, and went ahead and shipped it. So think of it as, you know, like I said, a warehouse management ERP. And then more sophisticated cycle counting. These systems will also uh, do things like um, uh, ownership. If you're a 3PL, if you've got um, materials on consignment, they can record ownership, et cetera. So hopefully that gives you a feeling for what you get in the two tiers of other systems as opposed to what's in there. So I um, guess I'm pretty close to being on time here. I want to thank everybody for attending. And the next piece here is, are there any questions? So Angie, <laughs> we got any questions? We don't have any that have come through yet. Um, I'll give you guys a few more moments to uh, type any questions in that uh, you may want to ask Bob. Um, during that time, he does have one more piece that he would like to um, extend to you. Well, in Anovia, we work with a lot of systems. One we've worked with uh, more recently is, uh, well, not just more recently, but we worked with a fair amount recently is InsightWorks. So it's one of the, what I what I call tier one systems. Uh, and they have a um, special on. Again, this is for a relatively small warehouse. It's a warehouse bundle. I mentioned before uh, five figures. So this knocks this bundle. So you've got um, two hand, uh, yeah, uh, data logics, a uh, barcode label printer, um, the warehouse inside software licenses has 21 warehouse and production modules all pre-installed for normally it's at my five figure number 13,000 and this is for this month I believe Angie if I remember right is for $8,500 so um, if you're interested in that that is well, that's a very good deal frankly and uh, software is good got some happy customers on it Angie, that's right. That's just that's for the month of May. Am I remembering correct? Oh no, offer, offer expires August thirty first. I'm sorry. Correct. Oh, it you've goes got a until bunch the of, end of August. Time. I'm not really, yeah, yeah, end of August. Well, this runs for a while, so that's good. That gives you a reasonable decision time frame. Any questions pop up since then? No questions. Oh, mm, I spoke too soon. Just one moment. Yes, we do have a question. Do you know if D365 is enhancing the standard WMS features in previous versions of NAV, such as 2013? I've heard that some companies decide to use warehouse management within D365 instead of a tier one third party solution. What are your thoughts on this? Um, so yeah, the whole D365, so NAV is being renamed Business Central, um, and that is basically D365, and it has, the functionality I talked about is in, um, Business Central, right, is inherent in Business Central. I will say, and, and if we take a name or something, we can get back to you. I'm not quite clear on the transition from D, if you bought D365, say, last year, and D365 to Business Central.
but um, if it's, uh, we can get you that information, the specifics on that. If it's, uh, if it is Business Central, if you're, it's moving to D365 and has everything I'm talking about, and you can use um, ADCS, again, if you turn on advanced warehousing, which is NAV's data collection. Um, again, as I said, that most people, I, I do have some clients using ADCS, not many. Most people are using this tier one, if they're using barcode scanners, uh, my experience is most people are using one of these tier one solutions. Um, it's just more robust use of the barcode scanner. It's just easier to set up a pre-set up, um, more robust usage. Hope that answered the question. Anything I else? Uh, no further questions, but like you said, Bob, um, I will give you uh, the person's name and we will contact you um, with further information. Great. After the webinar. All right. Well, right. Th thank you everyone for attending this webinar today. Uh, thank you, Bob, for presenting. It was very informative. Um, if you do have any further questions and would like to contact us, uh, feel free. And we do have more events coming up. So if you check out our website, novia.com, and go to the events tab, uh, we have a webinar coming up next week with Data Masons. Uh, EDI Made Simple for Dynamics Nav, Integration Without Embedded Customization. That's going to be on May 16th. And then on May 17th, we have a webinar on Dimensions 101. And Anovia's Mark Kane will be presenting on that. So if you're interested in these webinars or any other future webinars, um, please don't hesitate to register for them. We would love to see you on them. And we just want to thank you again for attending. And this webinar recording will be available on our website. Um, later this week for you to review again or share with any of your other colleagues. Thank you again everyone for attending and everyone have a wonderful day. Bye.